Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University. Silk, issue number one. I don't think this comic book is for me. And I think that a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is why some comic books aren't for me, including this one. And what could possibly be done about that to make comic books like this more palatable, even though for, they're for people who are not me. Let's get into all that good stuff. First, let's give credit where credit's due. So, Maureen Gu is the writer, Takashi Miyazawa on art, Ian Herring doing the colors, VCs, Ariana Maher doing the letters. Stonehouse does the cover, a whole bunch of variant covers. And, yeah, let's move on from there. So, what happens is you see this couple, uh, I guess they're a, a guy and a girl couple. I honestly can't tell. They look like two girls. Um... One of them's name, I think, is Carl. Maybe it's Kari, but with a C. I honestly don't know. Whatever the case is, one of them apparently lost a thumb fighting Spider-Man. That was probably from an episode that I didn't see. Don't really care. At the end of the day, these two go at it uh, trying to steal purses and money from a place that sells purses. I guess one of those Versace-type places. I don't know. Um, I want to say that it's funny when Silk shows up and beats them up but I don't find it being funny at all. Too much of it is just very irreverent. Too much of it is just weird. I don't know, like for some reason, basically they're just people trying to make money and Silk is protecting a big, small business, whatever. It looks like it's a big business because if you're talking about it, all this stuff eventually goes to the outlets anyways. I don't know that these are private places. They sound like they're the names of the places themselves. Because I don't think these guys get a discount if something goes out of style. <laughs> in, the, in, the, um, in the clothing and fashion world, that means after two months. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, that yeah, none of this really makes any sense to me. But they, they try to make the... Uh, the bad guy's a little bit worse because the one that definitely looks like a girl, she's got like little ears on her mask. She comes running up and uh, she says, I'm an orphan because the silk goes and says, you make your parents uh, disappointed. She says, I'm an orphan. It's like uh, she says something back to her and then she says, yeah, I killed my parents. I, I don't find that funny. I don't find that humorous. I, I don't find anything funny about that whatsoever. I don't find anything relieving about it. It doesn't make me, you know, want to say, oh, well, then she, finally, she's the bad guy. No, I literally just see two poor people trying to make some money in a world where they can't make money in. I don't know. I, whatever. Whatever this was supposed to show, it really didn't show it for me. I think that the writer is leaving too much up to the audience to just say, Silk is the hero, and therefore, anybody who she fights against must be the bad guy. No, not for me. Not for me. Uh, but that might have something to do with the audience. Give me a couple minutes to explain more about what happens in the comic book. I'll go into that. So Silk does something that it's very rare that you see. So rare that I can't think of a single time right off the top of my head that a hero has done it before. She gets some stuff for free. Now, I've seen people, you, you know, use that to get favors for something. Like, it'll lead into something else with the story within that particular comic book. But in this instance, it, nothing like that happens. Uh, the owner comes back and says, here, I want, I want you to take anything in the store. So, oh, I can't do that. Well, here, take something that's out of style. You know, um, take something that's out of season because it goes to, you know, the outlets eventually. She says, uh, no, I can't really do that. But, you know, that low cut over there that looks really good okay right there that's telling me that this is probably for women because <laughs> i have no idea what a low cut is it's something that's cut low but it's a jacket so i guess yeah i, I guess like a dress is that's that's considered a low cut uh, a skirt <laughs> you know is, is a low cut compared to a, a dress i that seems to be the case anyway it doesn't seem that low cut to me that the damn thing goes to her knees but whatever i don't honestly what the hell do i know i don't know anything about this um and she takes the whole mannequin in fact she gets the whole entire freaking mannequin I, I thought those things were expensive too but i guess in a place like this who cares anyway she gets this and she goes off and she's going to start her first day at threats and menaces which is j jonah jameson's new publication but you know they publish stuff on the web which uh, makes a lot more sense than a place like the new york times or in this case the daily bugle right so i dig on this apparently she's called analog obviously i don't read enough of cindy moon silk stuff because 
Apparently that's a name that J. Jonah Jameson has called her several times before. He got used to calling her that. I I don't know. I, I have no idea where that came from. Uh, it is what it is. Honestly, the f I've got the, the first appearance of Silk. You know what I'm saying? But aside from the times that she shows up in a Spider-Man comic book, like in the Spider-Verse or something, I haven't read that much about her. Uh, if there was another series with Silk, I didn't read it. I did read some of her in the Agents of Atlas, new Agents of Atlas, you know, but, but you don't really get into her that much. So I never really had a reason to get into her. So here's, to me, this is the first time that she's ever appeared in a solo series. I know it's on me that I didn't find the stuff before, whatever, blah, 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 blah. But it is the job of the writer to tell a story that I could jump right into with the character. Now, the writer did do a good job. What is it? Maureen Gu. She did do a good job of everything that's here. Like Basically, this is perfect. Here's who the character is. Here's what she's been doing recently. Here's a totally awesome logo for this particular comic book run. Boom. She did everything right in that regards. But as far as making me actually sympathize with the character, I'm still waiting. Uh, so much of this is unrealistic, and a lot of this could be on me also, because I just, today, the day that I'm reading this is the day that I, I completed my final class to be an immigration refugee consultant up here in Canada, which means, yay, all I have to do is take the entry to practice exam, and then I'm a licensed RCIC, <laughs> which means... Boom. I get to go out, get my own business. I got to pay fees to the province, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, uh, in order to, 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 to practice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm feeling good. The problem is I have learned a lot about the law in order to uh, receive that exam. I can't watch things like SVU anymore, Law and Order SVU anymore, because like I, my wife was just watching an episode today and they were talking about stuff that is Geneva Convention, which means that Canada and America have to abide by those things because they were signed in the convention back in 1951. Um, when I, so when I look at this, you know, I see everything that's wrong about what's being done here. So again, a lot of this could be on me, but things like walking into a police crime scene, no, there is not a single officer who would ever say, yeah, sure, just come on in. And he's a beat officer and whatnot. The crime scene investigation, you guys come in, and here's these people who come in and, oh, I'm not going to touch anything, but I'm going to be in here in the first place. As soon as that happens, I'm sorry, here, here's this case where they were apparently attacked by some kind of a werewolf thing that we see, we potentially see at the end of this issue. I'm sorry, none of this stuff matters anymore, just so that we're clear. Zero of what happens. The crime scene investigation unit might as well go home. Everything is tampered with. It's considered tampered with at this point. It doesn't matter if these guys went and touched anything, because anything could have been moved with a shoe or taken from the scene. Anything could have been changed. So, no, it, it, none of this stuff matters anymore. Um... Yeah, it looks like the officer's going to get in some kind of trouble. He's getting yelled at and whatnot. And these people walk out like they just don't care. You know, this was a, apparently a source where they could say, you know, hey, thanks for letting me do such and such and such. Uh-oh, here's a person coming in. It's about to yell at you. Let me just leave now. And they're making jokes as they're walking out. Wow. Way to use a guy who's about to get fired because in real life, this guy would get fired. I know there's a world where people cling to webs and things like that. That's one of the reasons why I like comic books, though. It's because it's so fantastical that I can't look at the stuff as being real. Until you do something like this, it was really just off-putting. Now, J. Jonah Jameson, I could see this guy as being a chauvinist, absolutely, in every way, shape, and form. Not necessarily a sexist, but a chauvinist, definitely. And some of the things here are really weird. There's the conversation that I had to look up the name of this one person who she references, who is apparently a uh, a, a character from Mad Men. Okay, this was a thing that was supposed to have a lot of chauvinism and, and whatnot in it. Uh, and in that case, just downright sexism. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. So much of this is weird. The final pages, and I'm not going to show you the final pages in this, but, you know, I, I look at some of this. I will show you the next issue, uh, the cover. Uh, listen, when I read this comic book, I feel like Cindy Moon is a character who doesn't play by the conventional rules of a superhero which 
could make sense because she does repeatedly say in here, I was in a bunker for 10 years. At one point she says learning how to how to choke out men or something like that. You could just say choking out people, choking out human, choking out whatever, you know, saying learning how to fight. I, I don't see the point in a lot of this. So here's, here's something that I think would actually help with the comic. As I'm reading this comic book, this is something that I realized would probably help the comic book community to better palette something like this. Because I'm positive that the comic skaters and the other, you know, a whole bunch of other people who read comic books that they know they're not going to like just because they want to do a review about a comic book that they don't like. I like to read comic books that I do like. When I find a comic book that I don't like, if I read it, I'm probably going to do a review on it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Unless you're a small indie production, in which case I'll probably just ignore it if uh, if I don't like it because I'm, I'm excuse me, not going to lie to my audience. That's just simply not what's going to happen. In this particular case, I thought that the comic book was extremely weak. I'm talking majorly weak. Now, my first instinct that I would normally go to with the background that I have on the company in question, Marvel, they've been hiring... <coughs> in the writing of Asian characters, they've been hiring a lot of Asian writers to write these characters. I haven't seen it with African-American characters, or African characters, period. Basically, black characters. I haven't seen it with any black characters, um, except in the case that is very similar to indigenous writers, uh, which that actually appeals to me. They'll do Marvel voices, right? Which is just, here, let's get some people who actually represent the people in comics, and the comics represent the people, you know, who are going to write about them, Okay, and the artists also. Let's do that. And something like that, I understand completely. I 100% understand. But when it comes to a comic book, getting an Asian writer to write an Asian character or a black, char a, a black person to write a black character, do we also therefore need a white person to draw or to write a white character? Speaking of drawing, because this is the next thing I'm going to get into, do we really need Asians to draw Asians, blacks to draw blacks, whites to draw whites? I don't understand this. How far does that have to go? Here's a character who's technically Jew, like Ben Grimm. Do you have to? Do we have to get um, Christian people, white Christian people, to come in and draw three of the Fantastic Four, but a Jewish person to come in and draw Ben Grimm? I don't understand how far this needs to go. I don't know how necessary any of this is. Is anything in here written or drawn cultural, in which case we would need an Asian writer or an Asian background specialist? I know that Jim Zub, a Canadian, a white AF Canadian, made um, Amake, I'm, Amake? Anyway, Snowguard, right? And he's not indigenous. The, the artist wasn't indigenous. Was that uh, Isaacs? I can't remember who that was. But anyway... Who did he, you know, when he did this indigenous character, a character who comes from Nunavut, that, that, that province, he actually got uh, somebody who is from the area and he consulted with her in order to find out more about the area because he was telling about a character he didn't want to get anything wrong about the culture of the character. Boom, that's it. That's it. I love the idea of that. This is someone who obviously cares about representation. When you're actually going to get an Asian person to, to do something like this. I'd figured that it would matter. And this isn't the first book. The, the past two Iron Fist books have been written. No, the, the most recent Iron Fist book is written by an Asian, but it's written by, um, uh, oh my God, how do I not remember his name? The guy who did all the G.I. Joe books. Uh, in which case, that's awesome. Cool, because that's just an awesome guy. Larry Hama, there we go. That's just an awesome guy doing a you know, hopefully awesome book. The most recent two Iron or uh, Shang Chi Master of Kung Fu books, however, have been written by Asians and drawn by Asians too. It's like okay, I'm starting to see something here, and I'm just seeing that a lot. Agents of Atlas, they're trying to do a lot of the same. I don't see the point in this when you go out of your way to make a point to do something like this. And now with that book, Agents of Atlas, I totally get. With Master of Kung Fu, I can also get to a strong degree. But here's a character who was in a bunker, I thought in New York City, I don't remember, but what does this have to do with Asian? Oh, Cindy Moon is an Asian character. Okay, who cares? 
Who cares? She, did, did she actually know anything about her culture while she was in that bunker? When she was in that cave? When she was away from everybody for 10 years? And how old is the character? We're expecting she's... How old now? So at the end of the day, I don't see the purpose in it. I don't necessarily need to see the purpose in it, but I'm seeing this out there and I want to know what is that? Like, why? For what reason? But I did say that normally I would look at something like this. I'm looking a little bit beyond that, though, because so much of this bothers Because I, I basically what I'm saying is I don't see the book as being any better having been written by... Uh, an Asian person and having been drawn by an Asian person. I don't see anything Asian culturally here that requires that people from this part of the world draw a book about a person whose ethnicity is that they're here. Because I could have sworn that realistically, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe Cindy Moon was born in China, right? Maybe she, maybe she's not a citizen of America yet, or she recently... Honestly, it's my understanding that Cindy Moon is American. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm totally wrong on that. Don't know. Don't care. At the end of the day, I just don't see the purpose for it. But before it's too, too hung up on that, who is this book actually for? Look, a lot of the problems that I see with comic books nowadays is that comic books don't follow the same genre format as a regular novel would, or even a movie. Every time that you're going to go and buy a new book, you're like, I want something to read. I'm going to go to a bookstore. Even if it's, I'm going to go on Amazon and buy a book or wherever to buy a book. Unless it's a new release, it's always going to be in a genre section, right? Is this going to be, including movies, is this going to be a rom-com? Is this going to be historical fiction? Is this going to be self-help? Is this, you know, like some of them going to be self-help? Is this going to be in the children's section? Now, I don't think that that necessarily puts people out of the genre of the book, okay? It, it does in a way, but not entirely. Case in point, one of the whole reasons why I started doing comic book reviews was because I liked the idea that they were going to be doing a Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur comic book. I loved the idea of that. That sounded great. I was reading all about this character, Lunella Lafayette, who's supposed to be the new smartest person in the Marvel Universe. I'm like, but she's a kid, so that's going to go over really great. An immature, super hyper-intelligent person that's apparently smarter than Reed Richards was, because Reed Richards wasn't in Earth-616 anymore, but apparently. Um, so I really wanted to read this. And there were a bunch of people who knew that I was into comic books and whatnot, duh. And they're just like, you should do stuff like this on YouTube, man. I would love to see you talk about this stuff. And you would like, okay, cool. So that's essentially the birth of, well, the basic birth of Comic Book University. Of course, I never got the chance to read the stuff because I got so caught up into doing other books. But eventually I got to doing Moon Girl, Devil Dinosaur. Now, obviously, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur is a book that is meant for kids. It's meant for kids. So when an adult reads the book and doesn't like the book, it's a very easy pass to say, this book isn't for you. I didn't like Moon, uh, I didn't like uh, uh, Squirrel Girl, written by a great person, Ryan North, an incredible human being, but I didn't like the book because this was cl clearly made for uh, young adult and girls specifically. This didn't appeal to me at all. I, I just couldn't get into the book. I think I've read a total of five, maybe six of the issues, and I just couldn't get into them. I tried so hard, right? I read three of them in a row for the uh, the War of the Realms, right? Could not get into it, but I understood that the book wasn't for me. And how many times have I said, this book simply isn't for me? And how many times do you get those kinds of websites, you know, those kinds of uh, YouTube reviewers, right? Or, or written reviewers, you know, from monkeys fighting robots or whatever, where they're going to bash a comic book because, well, this clearly isn't their genre, but they don't understand that. If this book were to say something like it was made for, you know, I forget what the, the term is that you use, that you put a book like Outlander obviously goes in uh, historical fiction, you know what I'm saying? But uh, historical fantasy. Uh, but, you know, books like Twilight, which go in the young adult section, right? 
or books like Blue is wait um, something borrowed, and then the the follow up book something blue, right? These were really good books, but I read them understanding that they were for females, right? A man can read them by all means, read them, but your opinion just simply doesn't matter as much if you're not for or if you're not um, the target demographic for the book, right? It just it just flows perfectly. Look. My wife has made me watch uh, P.S. I Love You, I think, eight times now. Might not be that much, but it might be that many times, right? I admit to liking the movie, but I only like it. The parts that I really don't like about the, the, the movie, I understand completely because the movie simply wasn't made for me. It's as simple as that. The movie wasn't made for me. I am not their target audience. So I'm, I'm allowed to watch it, but, you know, there's only but so much. And this is the exact same thing I say about action movies, right? Hey, if a woman wants to watch those movies, that's fine. But your criticism? I could give two squirts about your criticism about me watching any Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that's ever been made. It, the movies weren't made for you. And if you don't understand that, that's on you. There are plenty, especially nowadays, plenty of movies made for women, all right? rom-coms, whatever you want to call it, whatever they are out there, whatever genre they appeal to. You know, there's some of them that I like, and there's some of, some of mine that, that women like, including my wife. You know what I'm saying? She gets a kick out of Barry Gordy's The Last Dragon all the time. And I don't even know if that was necessarily made for me. It's Barry Gordy's Last Dragon, for crying out loud. But that being said, <laughs> I could sit down in Saudi Arabia with my buddy Ahmed, you know what I'm saying, a Palestinian guy, and be having a conversation. My wife left the room. She was watching uh, The Notebook, right? And we're sitting there talking, and we just trail off in our conversation maybe 10 minutes into talking, maybe only five. And then we, we find ourselves an hour later that we've been silently watching, not even looking at each other, silently watching The Notebook on TV. And we turn around, and we crack the joke. We can never tell anybody about this. We both right away tell our wives, and we both start making the jokes in... Uh, uh, in the school that we're teaching at, <laughs> you know, say like it, it's a and me making the joke right now. We made a pact that wasn't really a pact. That's just really freaking funny because we're we're two tough guys, and you know we're not supposed to like things like the Notebook, but it's a really good movie. So f you if you don't like it. Like it's as simple as that. But so that's what I'm saying. There are some things that there's some some genres that might seem like it's going to take somebody away from something, but at the end of the day, it's not. It's simply going to say this is who it's made for. And therefore, it's easier for someone else to come along, some, somebody outside of the demographic, and look at the comic book and to understand, hey, this wasn't actually made for me. I'm allowed to read it. I'm allowed to read a Del uh, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. But if I don't like it, it's as simple as, okay, the writer, the artist, whoever is saying, yeah, thanks for your opinion, but no thank you. No solicitors welcome. This isn't made for you. This was made for kids. Okay? I'm more curious what your kids think about the book and far less curious about what you think about the book. And then, and this could be like the pre, the, the Brie Larson comment, you know, saying about wrinkle in time. Um, yeah, I'm glad that you came and watched the movie, but I'm, and, if, and, uh, you know, that, that's great hearing, you know, what didn't work for you, but I want to hear more from black writers, black reviewers, right? That's what I want to hear. And women as well, because that's what the movie was actually made for. I think that it makes perfect sense. If these things are classified by genre, it's easier for me to come up and look at something like this and say, oh, because right now, without any of that on here, I look at this and I'm like, Silk, she's a cool character and I want to get into her. And I'm sure if it was another, another writer who came in, Asian or not, maybe I could get into it. This particular uh, character... I almost said this particular Asian, <laughs> wow, um, this particular writer, the way that, and I believe it's a female, don't want to misgender anybody, the way that Maureen Gu wrote this, this clearly wasn't for me, but I couldn't have known that unless I was on here, and if I wasn't mature enough to recognize that this isn't written for me, then I'm just going to sit here and trash this book and rip it up and cut it with a knife and flush it down the toilet bowl and all the things that I'm sure you're going to see on some of those other channels. These books should absolutely have some, all of these comic books should have some kind of a genre warning, but it's not even a warning, just a genre, a disclaimer almost, you know, I don't think it's that hard. Video games have age restrictions on them. Now, anybody could buy the damn um, thing if, it, if it's made for everybody, anybody could buy, even if it's mature. Hey, I could let my kids 
<laughs> you know, play the game. But at the end of the day, if something happens on there that I'm not supposed to, you know, that kids aren't supposed to watch, and my kids are like, I've got nightmares. And Daddy, in GTA, why does the card bounce? I've never actually played GTA, but plenty of people have talked to me about, yeah, sleeping with hookers and stuff like that. If I am dumb enough to let my kids play a game like GTA 5 or whatever, <laughs> I think that's kind of on me. Maybe it's just me talking, but I kind of think that's on me, right? And if I, and what kind of sense would it make for me to go and complain, my kid was playing GTA 5 and now he's, you know, such a, such, no, sorry, the maturity warnings are on there, okay? I don't know about the previous GTAs, but for, and, and GTA means um, uh, greater Toronto area for crying out loud. But anyway, Grand Theft Auto, nowadays GTA 5, it says on there, mature, <laughs> not for kids, mother fathead. So, right, it's on the reader. I think that that's something that they should consider doing for comic books. This way, when I go into the comic book, I don't have any expectations. I can't walk in and say, I don't have any expectations. So my expectation is that, I'm, that the book is going to be for me. No, no, that's just simply not the way it works. I feel like there's going to be a lot of people who go into this book and they're just like, yeah, dude, like, what is this? This character's acting completely different. There's a bunch of things in here that I guess that this is going to appeal to women more than it's going to appeal to men. Uh, I don't see anything in here that is going to appeal to Asian people more than it's going to appear to or, or appeal to non-Asians. I walk into this book not knowing what's going on. And when I'm kind of hit with a couple things that I'm just like, this is just such nonsense. It can't be upon me to figure out what genre this is made for. All I know is that the book simply isn't for me. This is far less of criticism of this book than it is a criticism of Marvel and just comic books in general not being smart enough, I guess, to really recognize that if it's good enough for the rest of the book industry, if it's good enough for the film industry, if it's good enough for all sorts of other industries out there, right? <laughs> um, then it's good enough for a comic book also. Look, I have never once walked into, um, what do you call, a, a, a women's clothing store and just said, this store sucks. I can't find anything for me, <laughs> right? I've never once done that in my life. And there's a pretty obvious reason why, you know? So at the end of the day, I think that comic books should be labeled with a genre, an age group, whatever it takes, so that we better understand what this book was made for, right? And just for the sake of conversation, since I used to actually be in the publishing industry for a very short while, but nonetheless, I remember one of the most important things that there is to determine whether someone is fit to write a novel or not right? Or, or write up any kind of a book. It could be nonfiction. The first question that somebody always asks you is, what is this? What is the genre? What is the target audience that you're going for? Right? And if they say, well, it's really just meant for everybody. You automatically have a rejection letter. That's an automatic. I don't think this is going to work. No, seriously. I don't even want to know the title of the book. I don't want to know anything else. One of the very first things that are always asked in the publishing industry is what is the genre of the book? Because here's the reason why. If you don't know where in the bookstore your book is going to go, then neither does anybody else. And you obviously don't know who your target audience is because there is not a single book out there, not even the Bible, there is not a single book out there that is for everyone. There just simply isn't. And if you can't figure that out, then whatever. And this is not me complaining about Margaret. Why do we say think Mar Maureen? Uh, Maureen Goo. This isn't me making a criticism on her in regards to this. This is more towards the comic book industry as a whole. They should know better because this is the publishing industry. I don't think that the, the, the comic book industry should get a free pass on something like that. Anyway, guys, this is my opinion for however much it counts. <laughs> and if you don't like the opinion... That's, that's on you also. Why are you even still here? This is, oh my God, this is a half hour review. How the hell did that happen? At the end of the day though, this is, that's the note that I really want to leave this on. This book obviously wasn't for me. 
and I don't even know who necessarily the book is for. I can't necessarily figure it out here. Is it for a young woman? Is it for an older woman? Is it for just women in general? I don't know. It's too hard for me to try and figure it out. When you try to please everybody, it's not going to work. You're, you're going to fail more times than you're going to succeed. And the people who like the book, I'm glad that you like the book. That this isn't a criticism to anybody who likes something that I don't like. It's as simple as, I think that it should be genre This way, if somebody like me comes in to read the book, suddenly I have to tailor my review around that and simply say something like, oh, well, this book is obviously, you know, it says on the front cover it's made for women, so therefore take what I've got to say with a grain of salt, right? It's the automatic grain of salt rule. And I don't think that's a bad thing for the comic book genre or for the comic book uh, medium. I think that's a great thing because it's what everybody else is doing. Not all comics are going to be for everybody. And if you know going into it what this is going to try or what audience this is going to try and target, then it's easier for you to understand this isn't going to be made for me. And and that's as simple as that. That also goes to the Ghostbuster thing, right? The 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 all women Ghostbuster thing. If you're targeting this towards women, and you simply say, this is a Ghostbusters movie made for women, to try and get women into the franchise. At this point, all men can really just shut up. <laughs> right? it's, it's as simple as that. That That's exactly how simple this is. Anyway, guys, that's realistically just my two cents. If you're going to give me back change, cool. I appreciate that. Uh, there's ways to tip below. Uh, aside from that, like the video, watch an ad. I'll talk to you guys later. Professor Bill, Comic Book University. Hey, class dismissed.